Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this exciting event uh, on uh, behalf of Alivral Ak Center for Global Islamic Studies. Uh, I'm particularly excited uh, to have this uh, distinguished uh, and very prominent scholars on Islam in China um, and your guests uh, for making this um, happen. As part of our mission, uh, we often cover Muslim experiences in distant parts uh, of the globe. Uh, but given our infrastructural uh, deficiency, uh, we do not have enough coverage uh, of the very distant uh, parts of the uh, globe. Of course, if you think of the Middle East as the epicenter of uh, the historical Islamic uh, communities and experiences, that doesn't mean uh, any other part of the globe is less significant um, in terms of uh, the overall experiences of Muslim uh, communities. Uh, the idea was brought up uh, not necessarily by current events uh, in China, uh, but the fact that we know very little uh, about the experiences of Muslim communities uh, in China. Uh, recently, I had the opportunity to uh, visit China multiple times, uh, and there, at least based on local myths, uh, Muslim communities trace their very origins as old as uh, Syrians. Uh, and they think uh, the history of Islam in China is older than uh, the ones in, in Anatolia uh, or the Balkans. Uh, so considering Chinese Islam or Islam in China peripheral uh, is only uh, based on uh, Europe-made maps. Uh, but based on their experiences, it's very central. Also based on, uh, and also what we know uh, from um, our historical knowledge, uh, is that Muslims were not only old uh, in China and integral uh, to Chinese civilization, uh, they also historically played a very crucial role in mediating relations uh, between uh, various entities uh, in China and the broader world. Uh, so we know uh, the romances, exchange of goods, uh, travels uh, based on uh, the Silk Road, but we know very little about uh, the exchanges of ideas, um, arts, um, culture, um, uh, even um, schools of thought. Uh, so Muslims in China, uh, unfortunately, did not receive um, adequate and due attention uh, from scholars. Uh, but um, looks like we need more um, nuanced knowledge uh, about various Muslim communities uh, in China, because that's another area uh, we often uh, have shortcoming in the, in the sense that we have, we assume uh, that uh, these Muslims um, somehow um, are homogeneous out there. There's a group of Muslims uh, in China, uh, but it looks like they are as diverse as any other uh, broader Muslim societies in any other part of the uh, world. So the purpose of this uh, one-day conference uh, is to bring uh, prominent scholars uh, in their area um, and then share their research uh, with us um, and facilitate informed conversation. Uh, and starting with uh, China uh, is sort of uh, a projection for our uh, future events, uh, we would like to cover other uh, relatively ignored, neglected areas uh, as well. Uh, so uh, stay tuned uh, in terms of our future um, activities. We will uh, try to organize uh, events uh, on the experiences of Muslim communities in non-central parts uh, of the globe. Again, here central is the birthplace of uh, Islam. Uh, before I give the word uh, to the panel chair, I would like to thank uh, those who contributed uh, to the conference, um, Anne Birkilba and Chidem um, Aishanur, and above all, Ahmed Tekeloğlu, and above all, Christian Peterson, who uh, actually uh, did most of the work uh, for this uh, conference. So again, welcome uh, and enjoy. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for being here, and uh, thanks for tuning in. If you're 
checking this uh, from somewhere else eventually. Um, I really want to uh, applaud the center and its leadership for uh, hosting us here. Um, uh, Ahmed Hussein, and thank you very much for bringing us all together. Um, and I want to echo Hussein's um, points here that this, this idea that China is peripheral, I think, uh, is certainly a construction that's both kind of a, a popular narrative, um, but I think also gets kind of reasserted in a contemporary period where uh, Islam, uh, at least in uh, Western news, popular culture, uh, is certainly centered uh, as where Muslims are. And, um, as many of the people know here, there's, there's more Muslims uh, in China than there are in places like Saudi Arabia, right, where we think perhaps is more <coughs> the central lands, uh, as you mentioned. So um, really, uh, thanks to uh, our hosts for bringing us together and allowing us to uh, contribute and, uh, and, and dialogue. Um, I think what we'll find after the, the day here is that uh, Muslims in China are very, very diverse. Um, I think we'll see that this uh, dialogue that's happening between uh, the global and the local. Next up we have Guang Tian Ha from Haverford College, um, bringing us back to the, uh, the sonic iterations of uh, the Muslims in China. So listening to lost sound, remembrance and its failure in the Sufi voice. Right. Hello, friend. That's my, <laughs> that's, my, that's my habit taken from Haverford College, the Quaker ethic, everyone is a friend. So. And I'm really happy that, uh, you know, I'm really happy that uh, Elise came first because, you know, I end this morning with a, you know, sound and music as well. And I think it's also very important that for every conference about Islam in China, we need to foreground what's happening to Uyghur Muslims in Western China. So I'm really happy for these two reasons that Elise came first. So the, uh, the presentation will be about sound, about the uh, Sufi recitation in China. So first I need to perhaps give you a brief introduction of who the Sufis are that I work with. And these Sufis are called the Jahriya, and the word Jahra means to be loud, you know, to be public. So the Jahriya literally means the loud ones. And for those of us who work in Islam in China would know that uh, there are four major Sufi orders in China. And of these four, two trace their origin to the Naqshbandiya. And you know, these two are the, uh, you know, the Khafiya and the Jahriya. And one argument is that the major difference between Khafiya and Jahriya is that the former practice silent dhikr. You know, dhikr or zikr means the remembrance of God. So Khafiya practice silent ones, and the Jahriya practice loud recitations. And that's actually not true, because now we know even the Khafiya have very elaborate traditions of loud recitation. So what's the real difference between these two? I have no idea. <laughs> Of course, you know, they trace different genealogies. There are also overlap between these genealogies, so I have no idea, you know, why they fight each other. And, uh, and the Jahriya claim that they, uh, they claim descent from Naqshbandiya in Yemen, even though, as you probably will see in this talk, that uh, their genuine origin is still very much subject to debate. We don't really know where they come from, not necessarily really from southern Arabia. And they concentrate primarily in Ningxia and Gansu. In, it's not really northwestern China. If you look at the map, Ningxia was actually at the very center of China, right? So it's northwestern only because Beijing is you know, on this side. So it's you know, the irony with the geographical terms. And, but they also have you know, communities in Yunnan, big communities in Yunnan. And they also have smaller communities all across China, as far as Jilin in northeast China. Where, you know, which used to be the Manchu region. So as I said, the Jahriya has communities all across China. So this is a map of basically the major Sufi tombs of Jahriya. And you know, this one is in Jilin in northeast China, the, the traditional or conventional Manchu area. But most tombs are in this area, in Gansu and Ningxia. And some are in Yunnan as well. And of course, some are in Xinjiang as well. And uh, like you know, most Sufis around the world, the Jahriya practice pilgrimage, not really to Mecca, but to these tombs of the saints. And this is one pilgrim, uh, a Jahriya follower from Xinjiang. And he made a commitment to visit all the tombs across China on foot. And uh, you know, it took about more than a year to really 
realized this, this commitment, this promise, and I, I actually met him and interviewed him while he was pass, passing through Ningxia at the time. And the cart he was pulling, actually, was, was a bed at night. And, uh, you know, it's, he's got supplies and food in there just in case he ended up in the middle of nowhere, you know, before the sunset. So highly committed Sufis. Now, since the talk is about recitation, so probably I need to let the sound seep in at the very beginning. And this is a recitation of the so-called Madayah. You know, it's a plural form for Madih. Madih simply means praise, and Madayah means praises. And in this case, it's a collection of poem in praise of the Prophet Muhammad. It narrates what happened before the birth of Muhammad. You know, each month there is a previous prophet visiting Muhammad's mother and offering their blessings. So this is a poetry about that. And the recording was made in May the 11th, 2015. Uh, it was a ritual performed in Gansu in China, in Lanzhou, commemorating the founding saint, Ma Mingxin of Jahriya. Maybe we can just listen to it just for one minute, just to let the sound sip in. <laughs> And that's just a, a section of the recitation. And the text was taken uh, from you know, the entire collection. And that particular section was called Da Zan, which means you know, grand praise. And the same uh, text was actually used in other Sufi orders and non-Sufi Muslims, Dungan Muslims as well. So it's not just a, you know, a text specific to the Jahriya, but actually there is a pool of texts. And Jahriya simply somehow just trolls from that pool of texts and pull it out for their own performance. So it's a common shared pool of text, I think, in circulation in Western China and Central Asia. And, uh, and normally, you know, they, the Jahriya recite Madaya or, or, or other Sufi poems while seated. But in this case, they're standing up because great praise requires a different kind of performance. So actually, they were, they were standing on their feet reciting that, that section. And I'm not sure whether you find any commonality between the tune or the general feel of that recitation and other recitations, because some people say it sounds quite similar to Tibetan Buddhist chanting, and I have no idea to what extent that's true, because I can't really, I mean, it's, it's nearly impossible to really, you know, just to put your finger on it and say, really, there is a concrete connection between these two. And I'm not sure whether you can recognize the word in that recitation. So in order to help you understand the words or how they're pronounced, I have a second recording, which is called Aurat, and you know, the word simply means the extra obligations Muslims perform in addition to the five daily prayers. And by extension, the same word also means those select verses from the Quran used under, you know, in this, under, on, on these occasions, recited under these circumstances. So I will you know, point to the words, you know, starting from here, as the recording goes along, and I may in the course of it, also chant alongside with it, because there is a very interesting vocal dynamic in the collective recitation. It's not synchronized, and it's precisely because it's not synchronized, some kind of common sense of being together, some sense of communality emerge from the recitation, precisely because we don't recite all at the same time. Wow. 
So I hope you get the gist of the recitation. It's more like, you know, it, it, it's the same for Orad and it's the same for Muhammad, which is the recitation I will show you in a minute. It's more like the rhythm and the continuity of the recitation can be kept only because we don't recite all at the same time. So we have that trust, especially when you don't have, this is just three people reciting. When you have 300 people reciting all together, you always have that trust that by stopping in the middle and taking a breath, somebody always take it over. There's always somebody out there who take over the recitation, who take over the rhythm, and there you can join in. So it's more like because in the Suf, you know, in Sufism, we have that analogy of spiritual pursuit and the ocean, right? So literally, you see the ocean emerging from the voices, like you're joining the wave and, and coming out and joining again. So that's the continuity of the rhythm. And it, that creates a sense of mutual trust, you know, based upon this kind of daily recitational practice. So my first question, you know, my first wondering was, how does this kind of, to my ear, strange Arabic pronunciation emerge? Is there a history behind this kind of, to, me, to my ear, you know, very substandard pronunciation of Arabic? Because in these occasions, right, it's a recitation of Sufi poem. And especially when it is the recitation of the Quran, you expect classical Arabic. You expect the kind of standard pronunciation, because that was the main thing. Right, for prayer and for other purposes. So why do we hear this kind of slightly strange pronunciation? So I asked a Jahriya, a young Jahriya under training, to read the Arabic alphabet for me, and he actually was able to tell the difference between their pronunciation and the so-called standard pronunciation that he also learned. So this is the recording he gave me. Xie 
خير يا أمفن طالب 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 جيم حار خال ضال ضال رابع زاي سين شين صاد طاد طال طال عين غين فال قاف كاف جيم بين نون واو هال يا no, I mean, to my ear, the first iteration sounds more Persian than Arabic. And one minor detail in the alphabet, which might partly corroborate this speculation, is that, you know, the, the order of these two letters, this is how they are supposed to appear in a Persian alphabet, not in an Arabic alphabet. So there is a possibility that, you know, Arabic for centuries was taught, you know, among the Dungan or the Hui, the Chinese-speaking Muslims, but they might have been taught initially by people whose native language might have been a Persian dialect. So in teaching Arabic, the teaching or the instruction of Arabic was actually heavily mediated by non-Arabic languages, and Persian being one of them, and possibly Turkish as well. And these three alphabets actually come from three different historical periods and coming from different social stratum. The first one come from the 14th century. It was used by the you know, imperial court to translate diplomatic uh, letters so it's used by imperial elites and taught in imperial bureaus of languages. And the second one was from the 19th century. It's a, you know, from an instructional manual teaching children how to read Arabic. And the third one was the contemporary text used by Jahriya to teach, also to teach young students to read Arabic. So they come from different historical periods and they were used by different people, not just by the Jahriya, but by most Dungan Muslims. And they come from different social stratum. But nonetheless, they share, I mean, they are surprisingly similar or identical in their aberration from the so-called standard Arabic alphabet. And if you read the words using contemporary, you know, Mandarin sound, it's actually, you know, this is alif, this is bir, tir, shir. It sounds surprisingly similar to what you just heard from the Jahariya student, you know, now. And that's from 14th century, and this is the contemporary times. So it's, you know, it's, it's just, I don't believe there is any kind of continuity, but the sound is so similar. So the first quasi-argument I want to make is that the teaching of Arabic among Dungan Muslims, judging from the sound we hear, might have been heavily mediated by Persian and other non-Arabic languages circulating in Central Asia. So even though it's Arabic that's being studied, but actually it's a kind of Persian linguistic regime that's expanding through Arabic without being necessarily recognized. So a common argument made about the Jahriya pronunciation of Arabic and also other Hui pronunciation of Arabic is that it's a corrupted sound. You know, because of synesthetization, it's being corrupted by Chinese. But there are a few points which that synesthetization argument cannot really explain. The first is you know, that cannot explain why one finds a surprisingly consistent system of pronunciation among Dungan or Hui Muslims across China. So the same pronunciation can be heard among Dungans in Gansu, in, in, in Ningxia, and also in Tianjin in Beijing. It's the same pronunciation. And the tune, the melody might vary from one place to the next, but the pronunciation are exactly, the, or nearly exactly the same. And the synesthetization argument cannot explain either why Prior to the 20th century, new waves of Islamic revi revival that reached China from Arabia, North Africa, or Central Asia never led to intense debates about so-called standard Arabic pronunciation and why the pronunciation was never standardized by later arrivals well until the 20th century. So, you know, that if later, you know, later uh, 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 arrivals from North Africa or from the Middle East when they enter China or you know, pilgrims coming back from those places, the first thing they might want to fix is the sound, you know, the pronunciation of Arabic because you are reciting the Quran every day. But that debate, which perhaps should have happened, never happened, so why? And the third thing which that synesthetization argument cannot explain is why 
uh, why late arrivals were somehow assimilated into the older system of pronunciation rather than the other way around, rather than, with, rather than a progressive, gradual standardization, all new you know, arrivals from these conventional centers of Islam, their pronunciation were assimilated back into the old system. You know, should have happened the other direction. But, uh, so all these cannot be answered if you stay with that old synthesization argument. And if we take the Jahriya as one specific example, the founding center of Jahriya, Ma Mingxin, uh, earlier scholars, including Joseph Fletcher, assumed that he traveled over land. You know, in the mid 18th century, he traveled over land to Central Asia for pilgrimage, you know, crossing Central Asia into Arabia, and that conventional route. But actually, according to an earlier Hajj, uh, uh, actually, it's Rashha, and it's, it's said very clearly in there that he actually traveled southward not really to Central Asia, you know, he traveled south to Burma, and then possibly boarded a ship on the coast of Burma. And from there, he crossed the shore of India, entering Arabian Sea, and then possibly arrived in Yemen there. Because according to the Jahir, you know, uh, Ma Mingxin went to Yemen to study. But there are a few things which cannot be explained if we follow this established narrative, you know, traveling by, by sea. First, we know the earliest followers of the Jahriya are the Turkic-speaking Salar Muslims. Most of the earliest followers were Salar Muslims. And we have at least one historical record that said Ma Mishin was able to speak Turkic with them. And uh, secondly, we also know that some of the earliest followers were also Tibetan Muslims. And According to the established hagiographic account about, about Ma Mingxin, he traveled to Yemen while he was about nine years old. And he stayed there, studied there for about 14 years. So he didn't really return back to China until he was in his mid-20s. So if you think about it, for a child who arrived in Arabia while he was about nine years old, and he didn't return to China until he was in his mid-20s, I mean, we can reasonably think that he has nearly entirely lost his Chinese. Because in Southern Arabia, I mean, he grew up possibly there, you know, 14, 15 years of his life, possibly speaking Arabic, if in that region, the local dialect, you know, studying in the with the local mentors. And I suspect there is no occasion to practice Chinese or maybe other languages. So if we believe that established narrative, Linguistic issues cannot really be resolved. These questions remain unanswered. How could he? I mean, he was not just able to be able to, he was not just able to speak Chinese. He was also able to translate very obscure Arabic, Persian, Islamic philosophical terms into Chinese while he was spreading Islam in, in Northwest China, spreading the Jahriya Sufi order in Northwest China after he came back. So how was he able to communicate with the people in that part of the world if he was away for about 15 years, his entire adolescence spent in Arabia. How could he keep the language? So one possibility is that he returned via land. And when we think about pilgrimage, we often think about a travel between two destinations, right? China and Arabia. And it might be a long trip, but it doesn't matter. You know, the, the entire purpose is to arrive at the destination and then come back safely. But actually, you know, we might reconsider that conception of pilgrimage. It's very likely that for Ma Mingxin and for other Zhonggan pilgrims, they actually stayed much longer along the way. You know, he might have spent maybe even 10 years in Central Asia, and maybe just two or three years in Arabia. And so he learned, so it's a, it's, a, it's a travel composed of multiple long sojourns along the way. So it's because he also studied maybe even longer in these regions. So gradually, as he traveled back, he picked up different languages. He communicated with people, and he learned with different mentors. And that's when he began to really learn some Turkish and begin to re, re revive his earlier memory of Chinese. And along the way, also picked up perhaps Tibetan or other languages. He might not be fluent in those languages, but he might have a working proficiency in those languages as he was spreading Jahriya in Northwestern China and also among, you know, among the Tibetan Muslims. So that's my, entirely my speculation, because to my mind, that's the only way we can reconcile these contradictory accounts. So in that way, you, know, you can say the Jahriya traced their ancestry to Yemen, but where 
does their teaching actually come from? Is it Yemen? Is it Central Asia? Can you really say? So it's more like this broader region is the, is the large area where the Jahriya Sufism and possibly other Sufi orders in China found their footing. One evidence that might support the Central Asian origin of the Jahriya is a key text, you know, liturgical text from the Jahriya called the Muhammad. And it's actually, I mean, the word Muhammad means the five-fold poem. It comes from the word, you know, Hamsa means five. And Tahmiz means to make a poetry into a five, you know, five-line stanza. And actually, the last two lines came from Qasid al burta Yeah, so, and, and the, 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 the poet or the composer of the poetry added the first three lines as a kind of extension of the original poem and also as a kind of commentary upon, the, upon the, the, the original poem. So this is how you, you know, render two lines into, four, into five lines. So this act of making two lines into five lines is called tahmis. And the poetry that result from this kind of compositional act is called Muhammad. And the compo we actually know the person who wrote this poem. His name is Muhammad Tabat Khani. And we know that he actually spent much of his life in Herat, in Afghanistan. He did, you know, perform his Hajj to Mecca, but he never really stayed there for too long. He was always, always in Afghanistan or in the large area called Khorasan. And we actually have one very precious image of him. This is Muhammad Tabat Khani, and he was, of course, a Naqshbandiya Sufi. And this is a Sufi Samar ritual. You know, he was listening to music and getting into a kind of ecstatic conditional state. So this is the, the person who actually, I think this is the person, this is the person, the poet who composed this Tahmiz. So if, you know, one of the central texts of the Jahriya actually come, quite possibly come from Central Asia, you know, and uh, then can we really say they trace their origin to Yemen because we can actually find the person who, who composed this poem. Now again, here is the sound. So I want you to Perhaps we can, again, I will point to the words as, as the recording goes along. And also, I will possibly also follow the chanting as well myself. And as, as you can see, I'm actually in here. This is me. Just the f <laughs> I hope. And this is actually a, the Persian translation of the poem. It is said that Tabat Khani actually composed this Muhammad based upon a Persian commentary on the original poem. 
So it's, it's, it's a translingual and translational practice from the very beginning. So what you're looking at is not just an Arabic poem. It's an Arabic Persian poem, in a way. So that's why it's, I think, I, yeah, it's a strong evidence of how Jahriya come from Central Asia, not really from Southern Arabia. So over the centuries, since at least the 18th century, substandard pronunciation has been built into the musical integrity of the recitation, as you can hear. And the so-called standard recitation, or standard pronunciation, now almost exclusively associated with, a, with a Wahhabism, real or imagined, especially imagined Wahhabism, I think, is looked upon with much suspicion among many Jahriya followers, especially those most dedicated to the memory of past saints. So many of the Jahriya told me they tried, because they know how to pronounce standard Arabic, and they tried that on Muhammad, on Madayah, on Aurad. It simply didn't work. You know, the, the rhythm simply broke down. And if you perform the Madayah recitation in a, in a Jahriya family and try to use the standard pronunciation, you will immediately be interrupted and just just to let go, because that's supposed to be, because you are reciting the Wahhabi way, and how could you do that in a Sufi family? That there's a very strong hostility toward the standard pronunciation. The sound, the structure, the ritual is entirely changed. So, another argument made about this kind of recitation is that, you know, it's, it, because we know in Arabic, there's a distinction between classical Arabic and colloquial Arabic. So this is more like colloquial Arabic used in the, you know, in, in the ritual condition, in the ritual uh, uh, occasion. But actually, you know, the Jahriya never speak Arabic. It's not really colloquial in any sense. And they know clearly that in those ritual situations, they need to recite standard Arabic. But they also know they can't. So that's the contradiction. They know it has to be elevated classical Arabic, but that's their classical Arabic, the pronunciation. So the question becomes curiouser. If the Jahriya recognize full well the differences in pronunciation between theirs and the so-called standard pronunciation, and if they know that in the performance of liturgy, standard Arabic ought to be the norm, it is likely they have known this for over a century now, then why did they not change? and what histories have given rise to such persistent sounds? And I have no answer for that question. <laughs> but I think in, in, in raising that question along the way, we might make a few interesting discoveries. And this text was collected by a, a, a Christian missionary in the, I think, in the 19th century in Canton, in Guangdong, southern China. And if you read the Chinese characters using the Cantonese, I wouldn't say it's an accent or dialect. It's a separate language in a way. And if you read it in Cantonese, this is Fatiha. And this kind of transcription has been done for centuries among you know, Dungan Muslims, Chinese-speaking Muslims across China for a long time. And this text, the one on the, on the left, I find really interesting. It, it looks like it's Arabic, and there are Persian letters as well. But actually, it's Chinese. And I can read two sentences from it. And because, I mean, the sound is really interesting. And starting from here, it's I, I fear the Muslim. It's more like aha, some Muslims. And then this is Nimun Ba Amel, we draw Allahu Ta'ala. All these tiny particles, you know, you should perform your deeds for Allah. And here it's Bu in we, Riya. You sama. Just don't do it because of sight or, or, or hearing. Riya shiki rimun kan gian ki. So sight is for people to see. And sama shiki rimun ting gian ki. So, you know, this thing or hearing is for people to hear. So if you perform it for other people to see or to, to hear, it's not right. You should perform your deeds for Allah. And then, Shengren alaihi wasalam shuo liu. This is really, f I, I find it really funny, right? All these particles, you know, Shengren, I mean, normally you find, you know, the word Nabi, it's a very, you know, common word. But in this case, it's not even Nabi, it's just Shengren, it's just, you know, Chinese word for sage, right? A saint. So Shengren alaihi wasalam shuo liu, especially this liu, you know. I mean, that's a, you know, a kind of subsidiary modal particle at the end of the sentence, which you normally don't find in literary text. 
So in a way, to me, these are not actually texts. These are sound recordings in a way. You are actually listening to the teaching, to the instruction, as if you were sitting in that classroom. So we are, in reading that text, in giving sound to that text, we are actually becoming a kind of gramophone. You know, we read the disc and we, we use our body and our voice to give voice to something that is supposed to be sounded out, not really read. So to me, these are, you know, all these, you know, there are a large body of such texts. It seems to me it's, a, it's an interesting sound archive. And this is just a, you know, one of the possible transcriptions using Arabic Persian letters to transcribe Chinese. And it's not really consistent because the same letter can have different sounds. And also, because people speak different accents and dialects and people use the same you know, Arabic Persian letters for different sounds, so you can read you know, texts and you can actually hear different local, local accents and dialects. And this is entirely, in a way, irrelevant to what you just saw. And this is actually from the 14th century. And I'm sure many of you know this is the so-called Bakspa script invented by a Tibetan monk, Bakspa, in the in Mongol period. And he was ordered by the Mongol rulers in the, 14, in the 13th, 13th century to invent this script because the Mongol rulers need a uniform script to transcribe different or transliterate different sounds, you know, Mongolian, Uyghur, Chinese, Arabic, Persian. So they need one new script that can fulfill the function of transcribing all these different sounds. And I think it's this kind of practice that, that traced back to the 13th century that gave rise to the kind of practice of linguistic sound that you just saw in that previous slide. And if you think about the previous slides I showed you with the three alphabet, you know, from the 14th century all the way to the present times, and that, it, it, it's likely, it's only likely, it's possible that this earlier practice used by the rulers by the imperial courts was somehow gradually preserved among the Dungan Muslims. This kind of practice, this kind of engagement with multiple linguistic sounds was preserved among the Dungan Muslims, even though, even though you know, it's lost to the imperial court in later dynasties. So what do we know? I'm wrapping up very soon. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, I mean, by this point, what do we know about these sounds? So first, in contrast to a tendency towards sinicization, which may be visible among some Dungan or Hui elites. Chief among them are the Hui Confusions or the Hui Rule. And their Han Kutub, you know, their Han books from the, from the 17th century onwards. In liturgical rituals, hence among those who practice such rituals, regardless of their meaning or origin, we may find traces of a long forgotten tradition of linguistic interpenetration that gave rise to Arabic pronunciations, which now sound all but indecipherable and yet are central to the practice of such liturgies. And along with, and perhaps exacerbated by the so-called sinicization, was also a process of binarization in that the classical Han Kutub, because of their philosophical and theological nature, tend to conflate languages and geography. You know, when you think about Persian, Arabic, it's really just Arabia or the you know, contemporary Iran. And what the Dungans advanced in their path towards sinicization by laying stress on ideas and interpretations rather than history, many Hui Confucians, these you know, Dungan elites, also tended to fix their eyes exclusively on Arabia or Persia, defined or imagined as distant lands of truth. So the result is the vast area in between and the rich linguistic interpenetration that gave rise to the now enigmatic sounds of, of Sufi recitation have been rendered invisible, and in this case, inaudible. So we can no longer hear, even though we're hearing the sound, but that history is lost. So we don't really know the history behind that sound, what gave rise to that sound. So in that case, the sound become indecipherable because we become disconnected with that history. So what initially was something like this. I think I might be exaggerating a lot. So, but you know. <laughs> I blame Keynote. You cannot draw a more precise, you know, you can all, you know, just draw a very broad oval. So initially, what might have looked like something like this gradually became something like this in the imagination. So this is the very last slide. Because, I mean, 
what I said in this entire presentation are speculations, I think. And, uh, but in a way, and, and it's speculation largely also because this is not really corroborated or, or supported by most Jahadiyya followers because they still believe their order come from Arabia, come from Yemen, not from Central Asia, even though there might be some connections. But I think by listening to these sounds, which even the Jahadiyya don't know the origin of, we might actually be able to reveal some forgotten history, forgotten not just by academia, not just by scholars, but forgotten really by the Jahadiyya, by the Sufis in China themselves. So you are, in a way, venturing into a field of where, where you know, the findings, the discovery cannot really be accepted by the people who practice the sound itself. But nonetheless, can we find any transnational history behind liturgical practices, you know, including the practice of sound, but also practice with other material objects, burning incenses, using ashes afterwards? So how can you find, or is it possible to find, a kind of transnational circulation of liturgical practices which which cannot be uh, uh, corroborated or cannot be found or cannot be read from texts that we now have. In other words, there might be a value to field work, to actually observing and describing, you know, in addition to textual analysis. So that's, uh, I'll just end there. Thank you. So, um, so next up we have Marie Paula Hill, who will be talking about Islam in Northwest China an overview of Sino-Islamic group, the Shi Dao Tong. OK, good afternoon, everyone. First, let me thank uh, Ali Vural Ark Center and Christian Peterson for inviting me to this workshop. Today's morning panel was extremely insightful, and Kelly's on, too. So, Today, uh, I would like to introduce you to a Sino-Islamic group called Sidotan. The first challenge in doing so is to translate its Chinese name into English. There are two, way, sorry, there are two ways of translating Sidotan. It depends on how we understand its meaning and how much we know about its history. The first translation might be the Western way whole, the second Western Daotong. And in Chinese Islam, Daotong generally refers to a place of Sufi instruction in its respective meaning. I will come back later to this key concept of Daotong. So my presentation today aims, aims at giving you an overview of the historical and contemporary development of the Si Daotong by underlining its political issues. I will do so in four points or questions. First, why Sidotan is not officially recognized as a Sufi order? Second, why was Sidotan called the Han Studies School Han Xuepai, by the past? Why was Sidotan so powerful in Amdo during the Republican period? And four, why Sidotan is object of spef specific treatment by the local authorities today. So first, why Sidotan is not officially recognized as a Sufi order? We still lack historical evidence to comprehensively describe Islam Islamic practices during the imperial per period. Some scholars argue that during the 16th century, Chinese Muslims oriented themselves toward an orthodox Sunni practice centered on the Hanafi school of law. After the communist takeover, following the Stalinist ideology, China was, in 1953, defined as a multi-ethnic nation in which 10 ethnic groups are Muslims. Official, official taxonomies of Chinese Islam adopted by the party state are based on Matong's work on Chinese Islam. But who is Matong? So here is Matong and his wife. So a party member and a government official, he documented the, ba the, the basic situation of Islamic teaching schools and Sufi orders during the 1950s. 
In the 1980s, he was the first to present schools and orders of Chinese Islam in a more comprehensive fa fashion. In his work, Maton describes three great teaching schools and four great uh, Sufi orders. The Gadimu, Kadim, Yihawani, and Sidotan schools, and the Kadiriya and Kubrawiya orders, and the two orders of the Nakshbandiya, namely Kufiya and Jariya, as we saw this morning. These four great Sufi orders are subdivided in more than 40 sub-branches. In Chinese, the terms used by Matong are Jiaopai, which translates as teaching schools, and Menhuan, which translates as Sufi orders. These two Chinese terms are not emic categories. That is to say, they are used by Chinese officials to depict Chinese Islam. Muslims rarely, rarely use these terms in referring to themselves. The term Menhuan first appeared in, in, in 1897 in a document submitted to the throne by Yang Zhengxing, the governor of Hezhou. Why, in the typology provided by Matong, is Sidotong not considered as Menhuan? To put it differently, why is Sidotong excluded from the Sufi order category? To answer this question, we need to reconsider the political context of the 1950s and the relationship between Matron and Sidotong's leaders. The founder of Sidotong is Matsisi, so <coughs> he's here in the kinship. Uh, born in 1857 and murdered by Ma Alian, a Muslim warlord, in 1914. His mother was one of the daughters of the Shaykh of Beijing Order, a sub-branch of the Kufiya. His father was the Imam of the Beijing Mosque in Lintan. So Lintan is here on the, on the map. Matisi received a Chinese classical education in a Confucian private school and a domestic Islamic education. He created a secular school called Jinxing Tang, the Golden Star Hall, in 1890. Then, in 1901, he broke away from his original tariqa, namely Sufi path, on account of a quarrel on funeral rituals. After a period of violent conflicts, Matisi decided to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, but was forced to stay in Samarkand for two years because of the turmoil in Russia. At that time, Central Asia was considered as a holy place by Chinese Muslims. When he returned from this spiritual journey, he called Sidotan the new path he had created. Internal sources assume that the, cent the center of reference for this location to the west is the Maiyuanzhang's Jariya order in Zhangjiachuan. Contrary to other Sufi orders, Kadiriya, Kubrawiya, and Nakshbandiya, Sidotang was not introduced by missionaries from Central Asia or Arabic countries in the latter half of the 17th century. It appeared at a very late period, at the end of the 19th century. It is a genuine product of Islam in China. From a liturgical point of view, Sidotan shared the same basic text with other Sufi order. So here are the three main uh, liturgical text used by Sidotan. So we see this morning the Madahi, the, Madahi, the second one, and there is also Mauluti, introduced by Malaitra, and Muhammad. The goal of the past is to move closer, closer to God. Sidotan believers understand Islamic law as the three vehicles that, at the first level, integrate the observance of the Sharia. So here 
are the three levels defined by François Aubin. Um, from a ritual point of view, the dirk is no longer practiced in public, but within the family. From a spiritual point of view, due to the break with its original Sufi lineage, there is no silsila, namely the chain of spiritual descent, contrary to other Sufi orders in China. Sido Tang's leadership doesn't pay too much attention to an imagined holy genealogy which would link the Shaykh to the Prophet Muhammad. But they believe in an intellectual genealogy which links Matisi to Liu Zhi, a famous Muslim scholar, as we said this morning, and a spiritual one to a uh, Jariya order. So here, maybe we can have a look on these internal sources. Maybe, Elise, you want to, to read it, please? OK. <laughs> Although Ma Qixi founded his path in an autonomous way, he was always in admiration of the success of Ma Mingxin's thought, for he made the rebirth of Jariya possible and developed its religious doctrine. That time, as he set out on a long journey to the west, what he saw and heard along the road sparked deep emotions in him. Upon his return home, he changed the name Jingqing Tang into Shi Dao Tang and showed his determination by proclaiming, Jie Lian planted the seeds, Guan Chuan made the flowers bloom, I want to reap the fruits. At the time, Ma Qixi used to discuss religion with Ma Yuan Zhang in Zhang Jia Chuan in the village of Xuan Hua Guang. Gang, and they were profitable discussions. Thus, relying on his noble ambition and strong will, he adopted the spirit of Guan Chuan to establish the religious tenets he wanted to propagate. Thank you very much. So here, the symbols like uh, seed, um, flower, and uh, fruit are very um, present in Wang Dayu's thought. So he, here, he used this kind of symbols. So. The reason is that the transmission of charismatic power inside this order is based on merit, like in the Charia at its beginning. Until now, Siddhartha's five saints are, have not been chosen along an hereditary criterion. The cult of the saints has been enduring, even if the tombs are very basic compared to other Sufi Muslims. So here we can see the so that is Sido Tang Tums in Lintan. And so this is the worshiper. And that is Matisi Ancestor Mausoleum in Dazago in, in Lintan too. So we can see the differences. But the reasons why Matron uh, but the reasons why Matron classified Siddhartang as a teaching school rather than a Sufi order were more ideological than scientific. Considering Siddhartang as a modern and reformist movement, Matron, who had lived in a Siddhartang compound in Lintan for two years, found a way to extract Siddhartang from Menhuan category, minimizing its Sufi characteristics. The Menhuan were considered by government political officials a feudal and backward during the land reform at the beginning of the 1950s. During the 1980s, a means to justify this choice was to label Sidotang as Han Studies School. So why was Sidotang called the Han Studies School? In the 1980s, Chinese Islamologists started to call Sidotang the Han Studies School. This qualification is rooted in the use that Matisi made of what we call today Han Kitab. At the end of the 19th century, the reading of Han Kitab was widespread in Northwest China in religious circles. The innovation of Matisi was to integrate this literature written in Chinese as pedagog pedagogical tools to teach about Islamic knowledge. His motivation was driven by the fact that the majority of Chinese Muslims were illiterate in Arabic and Persian. Overall, he wanted to make Islamic knowledge, even though written in Chinese, accessible to anybody. This practice was qualified as heretic by the other Muslim groups. 
so Matisse had to face strong opposition. This new way of teaching attracted numerous Muslims from other orders and also Han Chinese. That is to say non-Muslims originating from influential local lineages. Matisse succeeded in embodying both Confucian and a Muslim scholar. As early as the beginning of the 20th century, like other well-known Muslim figure figures, he paid great attention to education. His daughters were highly educated women. Following his path, Ma Mingren, the third Sheikh of Sidotong, created schools in Lintan, which combined secular and religious education and were open to everyone, Muslim and non-Muslim boys alike. From the 1930s onward, Sidotong started to be welcome intellectuals in its midst who had been trained in renowned universities. In 1943, the first female school, Tsisi Nuxiao, was opened where young girls receive a modern and secular education. The development of modern education was made possible by the general economic expansion of Sidotang, to which I would like to return now. So why was Sidotang so powerful in Amdu during the Republican period? Sidotang is general, generally known for its capacities to develop economic activities in Amdu during the Republican per period. But on what ground did this economic expansion rest? The 1930s, 1940s can be considered as the golden age of the Sidor town. In an, an, in an unedited document, Robert Agval, a missionary and anthropologist, described the Sidor town compound as a well-run society. Indeed, it was. Matsisi made Sidor town into a collective social economic organization. There were two types of belonging to this Islamic community for the faithful, either by living collectively inside large compounds or dwelling outside this collective structure. So here is um, the little text of Egval about uh, Sidotan where this organization was based on five so sectors of economic activities, agriculture, forestry, farming, manufacturing, such as plant oil mill, sewing workshop, saddlery, and trade. Ar around Lintan, um, 13 farms were built. So that is um, the large uh, compound described by Agval. Relying on these resources, the community expanded commercially. Its trading uh, company under the corporate name of Chen Xinlong became an important player in the brokering, transporting, and uh, selling of many types of goods. The Sidotong's trading network in the Tibetan regions war, was shaped both by long distance caravan trade and retail shop located at trading posts. For Muslim merchants from Tojo, establishing trade relations with Tibetans was neither original nor unusual. But this religious minority, which comprised a merely a few thousand people, managed to not only create an extensive and solid trade network with Tibetan nomads in, in Amdo, but also to maintain long-lasting relationships with their Tibetan counterparts. Robert Egval was introduced to Tibetan nomads through his connections with Sidotong leaders. At the same time, Sidotong provided Wolo Mabufang with horses and other products. After the communist takeover, the 1951-1952 land reform was not implemented inside Sidotang, like in the Tibetan regions. At that time, Matong was sent from Linxia to Lintan to serve as a go-between go between the Sidotang leadership and the communist party. Their negotiations led to Sidotang supplying resources in kind as their contribution to the land reform. In 1958, all community members were expelled from the compound for good and were forced to integrate the production teams of the people's communes. A majority of the male members, branded as historical counter-revolutionaries, 
were either imprisoned or sent into forced labor camps. At the beginning of the 1980s, after Deng Xiaoping political and economic reforms, the Sidotan members were politically rehabilitated. The tombs of the saint had been desecrated during the Cultural Revolution. Yet in 1979, the bones were bur buried anew. So here, here is, is the picture. Why does Sidotan receive a special treatment from the government today? From the 1980s onward, Sidotan community has been experiencing an economic revival thanks to the capacity of the Dotong to create a collective company named Chen Xinglong, the same that as in the past, and thanks to the current Shai Min Shengguang acumen. These trade companies owned by Dotong have specialized in trading silk and satin fabric and have reaped profits so that they have been able to rebuild worship places for the community and promote schooling. From the beginning of the 1990s until the middle of the 2000s, many young merchants benefited, benefited from this economic opportunity to earn a living and to learn a trade. Then, during a transition per period, the collective companies were progressively closed down and personal businesses replaced them based on individual profiting. Thus, the Dotong econ economy switched to real estate business. Like here, here it's in Lanzhou, Siguan uh, Shizhi. So that is a building of, uh, of the Sidotong in Lanzhou. And this one is owned by the Guangdong <laughs> uh, Cantonese. <laughs> so you see the, the oh, difference. Oh, oh, <laughs> no, yeah. The, <laughs> the small one is. <laughs> and this one is, uh, yeah. So I think it's, yeah. From a political point of view, Min Shengguang started a political ascent as early as the 1980s. First at a local level in Lindhan as a representative to the CCPPC, and today as a representative to the provincial level to the same political organ. He serves also as an expert of religious issues in different ad hoc commissions. In 1994, he was elected as an exemplar exemplary figure by the State Council for his contribution to the inter-ethnic dialogue and for promoting educative projects. Today, this economic development and this political representativeness enable Sidotran to expand itself in Lintan and other places in a quite clever way Sidotong is progressively asserting its belonging to a kind of Sufism via a quite ostentatious way, like <laughs> in this uh, picture, while proving its loyalty to the Chinese government by affirming its belonging to the Chinese culture. For the 100th anniversary of the death of the founder, Saint in 2014, Sidotong engaged in a double process sanctuarization and patrimonialization of its religious place in Lindhan. To a certain extent, uh, Sidotran matches the government's and parties' new policies toward religion in China by displaying a traditional Chinese style in the architecture of religious places, like in the past. But at the same time, the community reaffirms a core element of its identity namely the pilgrimage activities around the tombs of the saints and its capacity to foster unity according to the Wuma spirit. Thank you. All right, next up we have Eric Schlussel, who's at the University of Montana and currently at the Institute for Advanced Studies. That's right. Okay. Uh, he's going to be talking about the Emperor's Secrets, How Muslims Interpreted Chinese Rule in Qing, Xinjiang. Well, thank you again to the organizers for putting this together and for having me down to George Mason. It's pleasantly warm down here. <laughs> uh, I don't want to go home. Um, so today, you see, one thing that I've been hearing a lot from my Uyghur friends and colleagues lately is that we need to be putting Uyghur stories and Uyghur voices more at the center of our discussions about Xinjiang or East Turkestan, right? And although we don't have Uyghur presenters here today, well, uh, in order to aid that kind of effort, 
I'm going to be telling some stories from a work that many Uyghurs regard as one of the best and richest sources for the history of East Turkestan, written by a person from East Turkestan, and that is the Tarihi Hamidi, or Hamidian History, by Mullah Musa bin Mullah Isa Sayrami. Um, I'm actually going to spend the next year translating this work on a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship uh, with the aim to get it translated and available publicly for teaching purposes. Um, but I've been living with it for a while now, as I think, I think you'll be able to tell. Uh, <laughs> and this is also a project that when I last saw a number of my Uyghur colleagues before they disappeared, they supported very strongly. And so this is one more way of honoring their voices and their work, and I hope it, I do it some justice. Now, I should point out before I continue some, some background here, and one is that this work is written in a language called Chagatai. It's a Turkic language, a sort of the immediate ancestor of the modern Uyghur language. So it's like an old-fashioned Uyghur kind of, uh, kind of writing. And in it, Mullah Musa Sayrami, though today we might think of, it as, think of him as a Uyghur, a Turkic-speaking Muslim, he called himself and his people Musulman, Muslim. And I think we need to attend to that identification. Now, the text is interesting in part because it covers a critical and highly tumultuous period of East Turkestani history, that is, the 19th century. To make a very long story short, now Xinjiang had been ruled as a separate territory indirectly by the Manchu-led China-based Qing Empire until 1864. Islamic law, Sharia, was in place uh, during that period, and the language of government was Chagatai Turkic. But in June 1864, uh, Muslims rebelled against the empire, and for 13 years, a series of short-lived Islamic states competed for dominance in the region, the most famous being that of the Hokandi adventurer Yaqub Beg, up there in red. 1877 saw the collapse of Yakubeg's state and a reconquest by the Hunanese Xiang army based in Hunan province in central China. But the Xiang army did not restore the direct rule of the earlier Qing. This is going to be a key point later. Instead, they undertook a project to transform the Muslim people of Xinjiang into their own idea of the ideal Confucians, thereby transforming society from the ground up and uh, making East Turkestan a permanent part of the Chinese ecumen. Of course, that didn't work. These things never do. And you'll see some of the complex ramifications of that project in Mullah Musa's text, because he started writing, and here's his life. He lived through all of this, around 1901. In the aftermath of those events and during this process of reconstruction. And so for that reason, I have to be a little more specific about what that civilizing project entailed. Now, the Xiang army leadership basically believed that the Muslims, the Turkic-speaking Muslims of East Turkestan, lacked uh, one thing that they needed to be perfectly civilized. And that was, from their perspective, well, they thought that the Muslims were uh, literate, good, agricultural, good, and they followed scholars. Oh, the wrong scholars, though, and the wrong books. So it's the Quran, the Hadith, etc., instead of the four books and five classics of Confucianism. And specifically, they wanted to grant what Chinese called the li, the rights. And it's what uh, Maria was just mo mentioning earlier. We'll get back to that. But it's this whole complex of behaviors and uh, ways of comporting oneself and relating to others that make for a harmonious society and a harmonious cosmos. And it's all centered in their interpretation around the family certain kinds of familial relationships. They thought that Muslims had bad marriages and didn't know how to maintain a lineage. And they tried to teach them how to do that by founding Confucian schools that taught Chinese language and through forced resettlement of often displaced Muslim women into unhappy marriages with demobilized Chinese soldiers. So we're going to see the effects of that in Mullah Musa's text. So therefore, um, when Mullah Musa was writing his work, uh, 
wrong font, but that's okay. Uh, when he was researching and writing his history, he wasn't just writing down the facts of the 19th century. He was engaged in a project of recovering a past that was being lost and slipping from memory. That sense of loss demanded an intervention in the social discourse of the past. So he wanted to finally figure out what had happened in the past uh, several decades. And he was grappling with the question of how it could be that Islamic rule could rise and then fall again in favor of an even more aggressive and assimilatory form of Chinese power. In response to that question, he advanced an argument about the nature of politics from the perspective of an Islamic scholar living between empires. You know, British Empire, Russian Empire, Chinese Empire, it's the turn of the century. And that's where I'll spend the bulk of this talk, by looking at how Sairam used genealogy specifically to legitimize Qing rule, but also delegitimize the provincial government and sort of take the civilizing project and turn it on its head. So let's start where Mullah Musa Sairami does. On the outbreak of the violence of the Muslim uprisings on the night of June 3rd, 1864, in his home area of Kucha. Now, from here, you can tell he's a historian because he's going to look at several different stories, but from here, you'd think that he would go the next day, June 4th. No. Instead, Mullah Musa jumps deep in the depths of history to explain the ancient relationship between the Chinese sovereign and his Muslim subjects, because after all, it's in this breach of the peace that we must explain why there had been a peace to begin with. It's in the loss that we have to come to explain what had been lost. And he traces the origins of the Muslim uprisings to the Tang dynasty in the seventh century and the legend of the Prophet Muhammad's embassy to the court in Chang'an, the old capital of the Tang. To make a long story short, and it's a very <coughs> long story, the emperor had a dream in which he was threatened by a dragon that was about to eat him, and the Prophet Muhammad shows up, splits the dragon in two, and saves his life. When he wakes up the next morning, he asks his dream interpreters and astrologers what that was about, and they say, well, judging by his description, uh, it sounds like a man far to the west who's taken up the mantle of prophethood. They call him Muhammad. And the emperor says, well, bring him here. Let's send an embassy to bring him back to my court. This doesn't work. Ultimately, there are various problems with back and forth. The letter is lost. The letter is regained. It's a big drama. But the prophet sends ambassadors who travel from Arabia to China, passing through Xinjiang, East Turkestan where some of them die and leave behind tombs that become sites of pilgrimage. The story comes from an older Sino-Muslim or Hui tradition that's been adapted here, but in late Qing Xinjiang, we see a twist in a few different versions of the story that the emperor secretly does become a Muslim. He doesn't just see that Islam and Confucianism or imperial ideology are compatible. Rather, he secretly accepts the faith. And although his descendants forgot the family secret, they nevertheless kept the covenant that he had then made with his new Muslim subjects to always protect the Sharia and maintain the integrity of the Islamic community. Now, this story about the emperor's conversion in Sairami's work, the Tariq-i Hemidi, is actually the last in a series of conversion stories about Turco-Mongol rulers who have accepted Islam. And all of these conversions are dual conversions. That is, they happen in two stages. So the ruler becomes a Muslim, then has to hide it until he reveals his Islam and might have to overthrow his father or conduct a holy war. Or maybe a father and son pair complete the conversion event. Similarly, the emperor of China's conversion is first frustrated because he can't get the prophet Muhammad himself to come to China. And then it's unresolved in that it remains a secret for hundreds of generations. Now, to me, there's a suggestion here that the potential for the broad acceptance of Islam in China remains open. Indeed, there's another version of this text in which the emperor did convert, smashed all the idols in the Buddhist and Taoist temples, and converted China into an Islamic country. Now, we know that that didn't happen. So does Mullah Musa. But he's using the story to make a certain kind of argument about the relationship between the emperor and the Muslim peoples and what that relationship ideally looks like. So he explains 
that the Muslim uprisings happened because that covenant, after hundreds of generations, was finally violated through the violation of Muslim sacred space and through the imposition of taxes that violated Islamic law. And so these corrupt officials who had violated the Sharia uh, disrupted the justice of the emperor. The people tried to send letters to Beijing for justice, but the letters would not get through. And therefore, they had to rise up and establish justice themselves. And for those of you who know Chinese history, this now sounds a lot like a Chinese story, as well as an Islamic story. So you see, to Mullah Musa, it wasn't really the case that the people of East Turkestan were inherently separate from the Qing and only temporarily came under its rule, but rather that Qing rule is normally legitimate, or at least it used to be, in part because it maintains their separateness from the non-Muslim peoples of China. By using this conceit of the secretly Muslim emperor, Mullah Musa advances a kind of nostalgic vision of the Qing dynasty as it had been before 1864, which in turn provides a grounds, or part of it, to explain why that had ended and why it could be restored. So to build on that, he pulls out more legends. Uh, and because they're weird, because they go against the grain common sense, that's one of the reasons we know that they're probably intentional. Um, he builds on genealogical stories from the stories of the prophets, or Qsas al tradition, uh, about the prophet Nuh, the biblical Noah, and his three sons, Sam, Ham, and Japheth, biblical Japheth, uh, discussing how, after the deluge, his sons populated the earth and gave rise to all of its nations. These stories enumerate the various peoples of the world as the authors knew them um, and assign each of them an ancestor. Uh, in, closely, in a closely related tradition, similar stories serve to legitimize Turco-Mongol rule over various peoples um, across Eastern Asia. But most of the stories don't address the origins of a people that was now very much present in East Turkestan, the Chinese. For that matter, most of them don't even talk about the Turks, or simply say that the Turks are the descendants of Gog and Magog, which is pretty insulting. So this tradition addresses that family tree. And Mullah Musa tells us about how the children of Japheth, Yafeth, settled their various lands and fell into alliances and conflicts. He adds a few things to the stories. He uh, expands the list of the Japhetic peoples to include the Chinese, but also as descendants of the Turks, we have Mongols, Tatars, the Manchu people who ruled the Qing dynasty, and something called the Great Qing itself. The Da Qing in Chinese, Great Qing is a descendant of Turk. Interesting, why? Well, we'll get there. The point is to establish that the peoples of Eastern Eurasia were originally cousins or brothers in a relationship licensed by God, one that was frustrated as people grew apart and came to speak different languages. One of Mullah Musa's innovations in the story is to say that in the sort of Tower of Babel moments, uh, the ancient peoples of the world had to speak through translators or interpreters. And he uses the Chinese term, Tong Shi, that became popularized in Xinjiang this period in Chagatai as Tong Chi. So these Tong Chi, these boys trained at the Confucian schools who are pervasive, upon whom everyone relies to do any work with the government, have been written back into ancient history as a source of disruption in the world. We are going to see them again. OK. So the civilizing project was attacking the integrity of the Muslim family, and it was imposing a regime of translation. Both of these things are showing up in Sairami's story about the origins of humanity. That's it, interesting. Hang on to that. Now, as for Qin, the eldest and wisest of the sons of Japheth, according to Sairami's version, Mullah Musa asserts, here we go, that all of the emperors of China are direct descendants of this primordial ancestor who was the oldest and wisest of the sons of Japheth, so much for dynasties. And on this basis, he makes a pretty wild assertion that China cannot be conquered. It never has been, he says. Not true, but there we are. Rather, it conquers those who would invade it. It's another very Chinese idea. 
the great world conquerors. So Alexander the Great, in most of the Iskander Nama story of Alexander traditions, goes to China, often conquers China. But in the East Turkestani version of this story, he and the Emperor of China meet, and the Emperor of China only pretends to submit to him and then plots Alexander's overthrow. And Alexander thinks he's won, but he's just seduced by a pair of Chinese princesses. Genghis Khan couldn't conquer China. He had to marry a princess to usurp the throne. Amir Timur, Tamerlane, the third great world conqueror, when he turned east to march in the Ming Dynasty, dropped down dead in the cold as a, a result of his hubris. And therefore, Sairami concludes, the emperor of China and the line of Qin protects this land. OK, moreover, Sairami tells us that this Da Qing people, let's get back to them. Why is the great Qing appearing in this story? Has served to undo that fragmentation of peoples that took place in the ancient world. So the Mongols and the Tatars are supposed to be ancient enemies. Uh, Tatars killed Chinggis Khan's father, and, but also in the stories about the ancient peopling of the earth, they have a war over a stone that makes it rain. It's a really cool story. Um, but Sairami tells us that the Qing is a result of an alliance between these two warring peoples. You've brought these two houses back together and had a family reunion, as it were. The Qing has helped to bring disparate peoples together into a family again. So now, OK, what does the Qing look like in Sairami's account? We have an empire that's ancient beyond memory. It protects its Muslim subjects and the Sharia and has begun to say, solve the ancient problem of the, of the estrangement of peoples. That must mean that when Chinese power wavers, something tumultuous, something disastrous must be happening, right? Something transformative. The family is falling apart again. And we're back to the question of why the Muslim uprisings happened and why the Qing reconquest succeeded. So basically, Mullah Musa tells us that the loss of justice in the Xinjiang administration that led to the Muslim uprisings was the result of a cosmic hiccup. Now, as you may know, at this point in the Central Asian tradition, kingship and the fortunes of a ruler were intimately tied to astrology. Tamerlane, the great world conqueror, was born under a fortunate conjunction. But he says the Tongzhi emperor who ruled China in this period was ill-starred, born under an unfortunate conjunction. And so Tongzhi, the emperor and his court, could not understand why it was under his reign that China fell into fragmentation. We have the Taiping War, the Nian War, the Muslim uprising, the British invasions. The empire is assailed from all sides. Well, his dream interpreters told him that, as it turns out, you have a bad star. And until you descend under the ground, peace will not be restored to the land of China. And so in 1875, in a brilliant move, the Tongzhi emperor fakes his own death by descending into the tombs outside of Beijing, a subject with which Mullah Musa is strangely fascinated, and I haven't figured out why that is yet. So that his more fortunate cousin, Guangxu, the next emperor, can ascend the throne. In a bizarre Chinese ritual, as Mullah Musa describes it, uh, the courtiers and Guangxu's loving mother, Cixi, grant him years of their life, and a baby is turned from an instant into a man, therefore ascending the throne. Guangxu's justice radiates across the land. One by one, the rebellions fell, the invaders retreated, and China was saved once again. As Guangxu's star rose, Yaku Beg's star fell. This is the Hokandi adventurer who had established his state. The thing about Yaqub Beg was that, according to Mullah Musa Sairami, Yaqub Beg had usurped someone else's rightful place as a ruler of East Turkestan, effectively. And that although he was a great holy warrior, he was inclined to cruelty. Uh, some of Yaqub Beg's loyalist chroniclers talk about how it was good that he besieged and starved Chinese-speaking Muslims and marched them off to their death and enslavement in Kashgar, hundreds of miles away. Well, Mullah Musa is much more measured. When Yaqub Beg and his forces massacre Chinese-speaking Muslims or other Muslim people, he evaluates this very negatively. 
And throughout the arc of Yaakov Beg's story, he grows fiercer and fiercer and bubbles more with rage until one day, Yaakov Beg flow, flies into a rage and beats an old friend to death. He returns to his throne room and picks, asks for a cup of cold tea, raises the cup to his lips, takes one sip, cries out and falls down to the floor in a coma. And three feverish days later, Yaakov Beg is dead. His sons try to cover it up for two weeks. That doesn't work very well. And the Xiang army rolls across East Turkestan. Well, there's a very simple principle at work here, right? God grants the crown to those who are just and treat the Muslim people well. And sometimes that is a Chinese emperor who doesn't know that he's still a Muslim. But back to Mullah Moses Sairami. There's he, writing here, had accumulated a whole variety of narratives that were circulating in his time and a lot of textual stuff that was in the background through the Perso-Islamic historiographical tradition. Um, and in order to treat these stories systematically, Mullah Musa tried to use those tools that he'd inherited to explain Chinese or Qing power, seemingly legitimizing it without the Qing asking him to, or at least that's what we might see on the surface. And he's done that by focusing the stories around justice and genealogy. This complex of ideas becomes even clearer in the sequel to the Tariq Hamidi, or its continuation, uh, written in the 1920s by Ghulam Muhammad Khan of Yarkant. Um, so Mullah Musa had stopped writing his chronicle about 1908, but the manuscripts circulated across the region, and this guy in Yarkand, fairly far away, decided to use all of Mullah Musa's tools to extend the story beyond the fall of the Qing in 1911. So what do you do when the empire is actually gone? Well, he explains that in 1911, the last emperor, the Xuantong Emperor, had no children. He was five years old, actually, but that's neither here nor there. Instead, the important thing is, according to Ghulam Muhammad, that a corrupt minister poisoned the emperor and his loving mother and instead placed his own son on the throne, bringing an end to that ancient royal line of Qin that had been around since the days after the flood. Now, it looks like Ghulam Muhammad's playing on rumors about how the Empress Dowager Cixi poisoned her son, etc., etc. Um, and she, he probably got these stories from Chinese-speaking people, but that's neither here nor there. Regardless, through this illegitimate puppet ruler, and for reasons that remain really obscure, this corrupt minister decided to establish Confucian schools all across East Turkestan in order to force Muslim boys to speak Chinese that they would need to speak with their, with their fathers through an interpreter, a tongchi, the same kind we found disrupting the world at the beginning of time. God will not stand for it. He shatters the Qing Empire, which falls into civil war, and its diverse peoples are separated once again. Across Asia, uh, peoples who were once ruled by legitimate royal lines fall to Christianity and to innovation, bid'eh. The Russian Empire falls to the Bolsheviks, who Ghulam Muhammad calls Christians, the Hijaz to the Saudis, uh, whom he despises for smashing sites of pilgrimage in the Hijaz, and there are mumblings of Jadidism in the Ottoman lands in Afghanistan and in Kashmir, to which Ghulam Muhammad also objects. And so to him, it seems that the, the death of the last of the line of Qin signals the end of a global order which arguably had already fallen apart in Xinjiang in 1864. That is, this order of multi-ethnic, polycretal empires, where Islam was separate and protected. At least, that's how they seem to have imagined the old Qing order to have been. Now, this will help us make sense of it. And I, oh, I thought I made a second slide. Oops, that's fine. Um, for my last point, I want to show one more way in which Mullah Musa and people in his time were making late Qing or Chinese rule intelligible, and I think inverting some of it. And that's through this interpretation of that idea of the rights, the li, that came up at the beginning of the talk, the centerpiece of the civilizing project. Now, if we look across the archive, and this makes sense given what Maurice just reminded us of about how we talk about Sharia in the Chinese Islamic context as li, as rights. Well, Muslims in Xinjiang also saw this li 
these Chinese rites as a Chinese version of the Sharia, and often used them in a pair when they discussed them. They said, oh, that's not in accord with the Sharia or with the Li. It wouldn't be Li for us to do that when they voice people in, in Chagatai texts. And here they're mentioned. Well, Mullah Musa tries to figure out. Well, he, tries, he sort of confirms that hypothesis, that Sharia is Li and vice versa, but one is a worse version of the other. And he does that by trying to use Chinese sources. The Gang Jian Yi Zhi Lu is sort of a, a primer for an important historical work that was circulating at the time. And he tries to unify his ancient history of the sons of Noah with Chinese culture heroes like Tai Hao Fu Xi, um, the ox tamer, in order to demonstrate that, in fact, this ancient Sharia of Lu Wang, as he calls it, is simply a perverse version of the actual revelation of God. Now, this Lu Wang, I think he's talking about this person who is uh, Jiang Ziya and was someone who helped the Shang, the first dynasty of China, sorry, who helped the Zhou, the third dynasty of China, overthrow the Shang and establish the ideal uh, form of Confucian society. So it would make sense that if we're thinking about Li as something that, def that uh, defines generic and abstract categories to be enforced on the messiness of life, that you'd see it as being sort of akin to Sharia. It's like a textual scholarly system for, uh, that is also law-like. He can't quite make the genealogy work. He tries it in different ways. Fudak must be fung because they're missing the dot, things like that. Um, but the effort is there. And so what, what I think this is doing is demonstrating that, OK, so we began with the idea that the Chinese who ran the civilizing project thought that the Muslims had the wrong book the wrong scriptures and the wrong way of doing their families. But what Mullah Musa is saying is that, in fact, it's the Chinese who have the perverted book and who have strayed from the revelation, and it's they who aren't doing their families right. He's taking all the claims that the Chinese have made about the Muslims and turning them around. Or at least that's how I'm reading it right now. So to finish up. We have the possibility that the emperor of China may rediscover that he is a Muslim, fulfill the promise made in secret by his ancestor in the Tang. Now, not only does this mean that the Qing in the past could have delivered justice in contrast to the later regime of assimilation and, and, and cultural violence, but also suggests that these people on the border may in some ways conquer those of the center. And this intimate interconnection between the far edge of the empire and as metropole is something that we see in a lot of colonial literature. Right? There's this idea that, uh, well, for example, why would this corrupt minister in Beijing care so much about founding schools in Xinjiang? And then why would that be the reason for the empire to fall? There's intimate inter interconnection, which has been defined not only by the movement of Islam from Arabia through the region into China, but also by this uh, genealogical relationship defined in history. Where was I? Sorry, I don't normally get lost at this stage, but here we are. It's just so much fun being here. <laughs> so Mullah Musa's histories have been very much in the tradition of perso islamic history writing, as you know it from various Turco-Mongol rulers, uh, from Akbar, Babur, all these people who had histories written for them to legitimize their rule. But I think that Sairami, Mullah Musa, in his odd position as someone who's under the domination of an alien people, who are not seeking legitimacy in the Islamic mode, and someone who's trying to use that stuff, that tradition to write about his world. Um, it's a very different thing. He's, he's using that tradition without a patron to make sense of his world as a dominated person at the edge of empire. And I would argue that Mullah Musa's account of the 19th century and of the history of the world reflects a profound sense of nostalgia for something that was lost, the world of a plural Qing empire. To put it another way, for an imperial world in which Muslims in general and Uyghurs specifically were left to their own way of life. And even though that golden age was in many ways imagined, 
The violence of the Muslim uprisings, the reconquest, and the intervening years of conflict, followed by the new violence of the civilizing project, made it seem like something very important had been lost. And Sairami, in trying to come to terms with that sense of loss, wrote a history that tried to explain it and therefore imagined the past. And this is one of the things I'm going to be exploring over the course of the year as the Sairami project proceeds and I produce a translation of the text. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the conversation. All right, so now we have Jorwell, who will be talking about translating the natural world, Arabo-Persian philosophy of nature in late imperial China. Okay, so uh, thank you all for being here at this late hour. For me, it's actually later because it's like German time. Um, but I would like to, to thank very much uh, Christian and to thank uh, the, the center, the Alivur al Ark Center, for inviting me here and for all of you for staying. And uh, I'm looking forward to hear your, uh, co your comments and your, uh, and your ideas regarding my talk. Um, I would like in many ways to bring into the table, to bring into our discussion earlier periods, like uh, to go further in history to the high, to the high early modern, if you want to call it, of, uh, of uh, Asia and of China. And for doing that, we actually need to go back to some of the points that uh, were mentioned at the beginning of the conference. And this is about the categories that we are talking about. There is. Uh, there are some problems of using categories as religion, as ethnicity, when we talk about, uh, the, about those people that I'm going to talk about, about Islam in China, if you want, Muslims in China, readers of Islamic texts, readers of Arab or Persian texts, any of those uh, categories, uh, when we talk about the early modern period. Uh, the problem is not only historiographical, it also has some uh, if you want to call political uh, issues that come out of it, because when we talk in the early modern uh, context about religion in China or ethnicity, we marginalize groups, and in many ways we take them away from a mainstream. I would like to, to present like um, another story, an episode in the history of China that actually takes the people that we all talk about but put them in the mainstream. They are producers of knowledge. They are brokers, actually, between walls of different uh, readers' communities. But that's, their, their main, uh, that's the main contribution to our history. When we look from this type of, the, from, the, from this perspective, we actually find that readers of Arab or Persian texts in China introduce to China new things introduced to China things that we usually connect either with uh, what we call uh, Western learning, with Western knowledge, or we usually uh, um, give the credit to uh, European missionaries in bridging the world. We are thinking that Europe was not the necessary actor to bridge between the world. We have actually other actors that, uh, that go between those worlds and can help us. Um, so. In many ways, what I'm trying to bring here, I try to bring our story. Yeah, he, it's very nice. Yeah, I got like this, the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but actually, for me, it works because I want to bring Asia. I want to bring parts of the Greco-Roman, European, and I want to create some sort of a connected world history of ideas and texts that are not bound by nation, ethnicities, religions or any other kind of categories like that. Um, um, OK, so before I start, I want to give you an idea of what it means, like uh, what, what Islamic knowledge in China means, and how Islamic knowledge, or if you want to call it Arab or Persian knowledge, if you want to emphasize the linguistic part and not the religious aspect of it, Moved. So actually, we have in our sources, we have uh, a rather abundant uh, repositories of evidence for all sorts of movements that go from the early centuries of Islam. We have an amazing evidence, for example, that uh, is written in an Arabic uh, uh, work on bibliography, Ibn Nadim, if anybody, if you know it, that mentions a Chinese uh, student at the school, at the local school of uh, the polymath uh, Arazi, uh, that, that wanted to copy 
the works of Galen, the medical works of Galen, and take them to China. There is a whole story about how this kind of voluminous work can be copied, but this is an indication, for example, that already in works that were written in the ninth century, there is this idea that, move, and, and that knowledge moves and uh, texts definitely bring experience of one part of the world to another part of the world. Um, we have much more substantial evidence uh, from the Mongol period. In the Mongol period, let me just see what's the next one. In the Mongol period, we actually have, uh, for the first time in Chinese history, institutions in China, official institutions at the Chinese court that as their, as their official, uh, um, in their official capacity, uh, they need to read Arabo-Persian texts and in many ways implement Arabo-Persian knowledge. Uh, for the first time in China, we have libraries that accommodate all of those texts. And we, ha we, we, we begin to have like a, uh, a substantial uh, repository of text on various uh, ideas. Just to give you some visual thing of what it means, how texts, what, uh, what uh, to visual, how movement of knowledge looks like in the Chinese context, we have here a text that is called Jahan Donesh. This is an astronomical text uh, in Persian, very beautiful manuscript. You see uh, uh, illustrations, colors, and things. What makes it so special, and what makes it like an evidence to a Chinese uh, to a Chinese uh, 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 movement is this? How many six letters that are at the margins of the of the manuscript that say uh, category of Tian uh, thirty five uh, number thirty five, which is a catalog number of the manuscript. At one point, this Persian astronomical text was part of an official official repository, and we're dealing here with the repository of the, of the early 15th century. So this is an example for how Chinese, uh, sorry, how Chinese repositories began to accumulate uh, text on a Greco-Roman Arabo-Persian experience, uh, and in many ways, as we'll see soon, brought their own insights by reading those texts. Um, we have a very interesting um, uh, edict written by the Bureau of Astronomy in China that lists, give us lists of books that uh, had to be moved because of some worms or something that ate uh, some of the shelves there between rooms. And this list gives a very interesting uh, collection of texts that include, of course, uh, astronomical mathematics that go from Euclid <coughs> and other books, but it, it has a, a title that is Shir. For example, uh, uh, the Muqamat, if you want, uh, or Tariq. Very generic terms, but in many ways suggest that within this kind of polymath expertise, within those expertise on specific fields, we have much more, much wider experience moving be between the world. Um, we see that. Uh, um, Sorry, by the 13th, uh, by the 1368, the century of the Yuan, of the Mongol uh, rule over China, f uh, it comes to its end. And we have like a new dynasty comes, and we often like to present this dynasty as a Chinese that in many ways wants to fight against or to, to uh, present an alternative to the old barbarian customs. But actually what we see de facto that the, 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 the first emperor at least of this, of this emperor is very pragmatic. And one of the first thing he does is once he conquers Beijing, the, the, the capital of, of the Yuan of the Mongol Emperor, is to move the library, the, the, the imperial library to Nanjing, the new capital. And within that, we, we get that in various uh, records of that event, there are hundreds of Jen, hundreds of scrolls of Arabic and Persian texts, which means that in both symbolic but also very physical manner, the Ming, the new Chinese government, takes over this huge repository of Arab or Persian uh, experience. Now, selected a uh, number of those texts in, uh, during this period also became uh, translated, uh, like we translate into Chinese and present us here with a new niche, a new layer into this kind of development where we see that not only knowledge was brought passively, but we actually have here interpretive uh, apparatus uh, or interpretive layers uh, that the Chinese bring into this knowledge. 
I would like in many ways to concentrate due to our uh, time constraint on one specific episode. Now this specific episode uh, begins at the end of the 16th century. The, 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 at the background of this episode stands all of this accumulation of text that starts with the, with the Yuan and then in the Ming moves between the court and uh, private hands. And by the mid 16th century, we have like a substantial number of texts that are scattered around China, just waiting for people to come and reclaim them. Around the time, we see that there are all sorts of sociopolitical uh, changes within China. We suddenly have uh, this opening of knowledge. We have uh, new uh, ideologies that in many ways claim that, if anybody knows of Wang Yangming uh, kind of theory, that claims that everybody can study and every text is worth, uh, is worth uh, uh, reading and every type of, uh, of uh, uh, text or every type of ideology is worth studying on one hand, and we have intensity of movements of people from outside, of, from Transoxiana into China. So the, 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 the merger of those two things brings a very interesting movement into, account, into uh, play. And this is a movement that centers around a person by the name of Hu Denzhou. This guy, which we know very little on, and we know mostly from um, like semi-hagiographical uh, uh, records that uh, third, uh, uh, third generation students of his uh, wrote, uh, established a small school in uh, Shanxi, in his hometown. His, <coughs> his insight into Arabo-Persian scholarship began by an, uh, by an incidental meeting with uh, a person that we have his name, Jaloli, in, in Beijing, in one of his visits in Beijing. And this Jolali introduced to him an Arabic text by the name, a name that we haven't heard today, Maqamat, the Maqamat of Al-Hariri. Maqamat Al-Hariri is, is a text on uh, literary, uh, it's a literary collection that involves various stories. But for Hu Dengzhou, this book in many ways brought up two things. First of all, it brought up new nuances into the operation of the world. Like he saw in those stories things that he claims that he couldn't find elsewhere. And the second thing, and this is more the literary criticism or the literary scholarship behind it, he finds that there is a value for a higher or more uh, intensive study of language, something that he couldn't find, not in the traditional musk education where people learn only how to recite without having any uh, aspects of rhetoric, any aspects of logic into their writing, nor uh, in any other form. He in many ways felt that there is here asymmetry between uh, what he finds elsewhere in the Islamic world like Al-Maqamat, what he finds in the, the uh, Chinese schools that teach the Confucian, uh, the Confucian uh, uh, classics, and uh, the lack of that in his, in his own circles. So he opens up, he builds a, a school that in many ways tries to promote a new form of scholarship, a scholarship that puts into, uh, into stakes, that in many ways emphasizes um, ideas of grammar, we're talking about uh, a, a cultural, uh, like a scholarly culture in China that the idea of grammar doesn't play a role. We don't, uh, people, the, the concept that we talk about how to uh, analyze a sentence or any analytical framework of a text does no, is not part of the academic discourse. So first of all, uh, a grammatical reading of text and then through uh, uh, intensive reading also understanding nuances into the operation of the, of the, of the natural world. Hu Dengzhou's school gradually uh, uh, grows up as his students open their own schools and each of them, you know, so we, cre we cre create here a network. Each of them goes on journeys to look for texts and we find us within a few decades with a network that teaches a new pedagogy, a new insight into Arabo-Persian knowledge. Um, just to give you an idea of what it means, like this intensive uh, writing, try to read this and you see all of this, uh, you know, millions of interlinear and marginalia represent 
what we do with the text when we actually are interested in deeper levels. Um, within few, uh, within few uh, decades, his students decided that they want to publish their notes. So if we have uh, the first generation, we have people that sit with a tutor writing for themselves or even or memorizing notes, within few generations they decide to take those notes and circulate. And here we actually find something that rem reminds, uh, reminds uh, what we mentioned before. We find those publications with very vernacular kind of terminology talking about uh, a text that are of the highest uh, intellectual uh, level within vernacular, with vernacular Chinese. And another thing, um, we have here uh, the development of a literature in the Chinese language that is built on those notes, but caters for a wider audience, an audience that doesn't read those languages, but still are, is interested in the nuances that are, appear there. And a second, a literature that fits into the aesthetical standards of Chinese, you know, that is not vernacular nor, uh, nor a foreign language. Um, in order to create this kind of scholarship, scholars need to launch on, you know, launch on journeys across China to go to find those, ter those works. They rarely go outside of China, although we have various uh, uh, claims of people that go to do Hajj. Actually, we don't have substantial evidence that it, before the 18th century, people went on Hajj. It wasn't like uh, an easy task for them. But in China, in libraries in China, they can find enough text to, to in many ways, supplement or to, 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 uh, uh, to, to, to uh, serve as their, as their text for this kind of scholarship. So for example, uh, uh, Liu Zhi, that we mentioned as like the the uh, one of the, the one of the masters, if you want to, the one of the authors of the Xi Dao uh, Xi Dao Tang, wrote in one of his prefaces. He gave a very very long preface that describes how he went between areas in China, and we're talking about China. This is not like uh, Virginia. This is like a huge place. So <laughs> from uh, Shandong to you know to to Yunnan, looking for texts, you know. And he finds a number of texts that afterwards he translates or he paraphrases and produces. But what is interesting that he also brings up what exactly is his main aim in those texts. What kind of texts he look or what is he looking when he searches or when he reads those texts. And the things that he mentioned is that I search, uh, sorry, where would I begin it? I wish to write a text on the conjunctions of the three extremes. The three extremes is a Chinese term for what we would call, what we would call the natural sciences. Understanding the, 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 understanding the correspondences between the cosmos, human society, uh, and uh, the physical world. So those kind of, of three layers, uh, uh, heaven, earth and men, the three extremes. And he searched in various places. He searched in those libraries. He found all sorts of, uh, of, uh, of works there. But he also searched in bookstores in this time. And he actually claims that he couldn't find too many. But he found two that he gives us by, uh, he gives us uh, in uh, one of uh, his bibliographies, his, their Arabic name, Mirat al-Insan, which is a text that we don't know which one it is. But al-Mawaqif, which is a very important text on theology. He looks at those texts and he suggests that those two texts include the study of the three extremes and he actually frames them as, uh, he frames this uh, uh, type of scholarship within the study of the natural world that begins to appear in China during that period. Um, so as we can see here in many ways, although uh, those people might read tafsir, which is like uh, uh, commentaries or, uh, or uh, commentaries on the Quran, hadith, on one hand, uh, theological works, kalam or, or Sufism, they're not necessarily interested for religious purposes in those. That might be one of, uh, for some people, that might be one of the aims. But they're interested to see what those texts tell us about experiences of people of the cosmos, of the human bodies, 
in those other parts of the world that can in many ways supplement, can add to our, uh, our own experiences. So in many ways, what they want to do with those texts is to find the nuances of the natural world. Now, what kind of text do they find uh, in in, uh, uh, in in like between uh, late uh, 16th century and uh, and uh, uh, let's say uh, 1725, for example. So we see that we have, as I mentioned here, uh, we have a wide range of things. Fiqh, for example, Hanafi fiqh is still a very very important uh, section. In many cases, we need to take into account that those are not in contrast, for example, for the, to, for, to the Jesuits or other uh, brokers of knowledge. Those texts arrived in China not by demand. It's not that somebody decided that fiqh, Hanafi fiqh uh, is the right uh, genre for such, uh, for such uh, study, but rather these are the texts that they found. And what they need to do now is to take what they found and to reconstruct from this as a theory and a pedagogy. So we see that we have fiqh as a, a crucial thing. Irfan is like what we would call Sufism or a more mystical aspect of Sufism. Grammar. And here it's interesting to see that in their grammatical studies, they don't differentiate necessarily between, between uh, Arabic and Persian, but take this as one language with two different layers of two registers, if you want, uh, according to functions and aesthetics and others. Uh, Oops, just to give you an idea of maybe the languages, Arabic definitely is there, but Persian is the one that is used for writing for, and also for translating the Arabic. Arabic is there because uh, the texts that they have are texts of the classical, for example, periods, we'll see it in a, in a second, that uh, um, uh, were brought from areas where vernacular literature on hadith on, for example, tafsir are not interesting. We can see that, for example, the 13th and 14th century works, if it's Al-Hidayah, if you know, if people are aware with like a jurisprudence uh, literature, are still like the important thing. But we have some that are a little bit more contemporary. But still, since there is almost no there is very limited entrance of new text, and what they need to do is to look for things that are in libraries thing. there. Uh, the texts tend to be like a, a, a number of centuries old. What exactly did they do when they read those texts? And here we get to one of the more innovative things that in many ways stand on par with uh, other uh, schools in China that promoted intensive readings of text. What do you do? when you want to get layers of text from, uh, from below the main text. In doing that, Hu Dangzhou and his, and his uh, followers developed a system of three layers. When we read a text, we need to look, first of all, for the syntactical or grammatical layers. We need to mark exactly <coughs> what serves here as, you know, as the topic, as the, as the subject, and one, what is the attributes, etc. Once we understand the sentences, then we can get into the nuances. The second level, and this is a very important level, this is the, uh, uh, of, uh, the level of mantic. If you think of uh, Western or European uh, schol uh, schol uh, scholasticism, uh, logic and mantic uh, are the crucial things. So here we actually have uh, importation of logical scholarship through the study of Arabo-Persian texts, and there are actually texts uh, text that uh, uh, occupy that, uh, that that teach specifically logic and how to how to understand uh, specific um, uh, logical. Uh, constructs. The third one is balagha, is rhetorics in Arab or Persian. What makes a text aesthetical? How do we quote? What is a metaphor? We get here to uh, a very uh, extensive study of, uh, of uh, literary criticism. Again, how those things look like? Yeah, so that's how what happens. We have various uh, interlinear uh, uh, layers that uh, maybe the next one will show it a little bit better that marks sub uh, marks grammatical layers brings out nuances on of uh, logic and balaga often comes on the sides with marginality that explains all sorts of uh, intertextuality all sorts of uh, uh, textual ideas this is for example a uh, uh, 
this is a folio from the Issa, uh, the uh, Issa Gog, if you know. This is a, a very important work on logic that afterwards was, bro was brought also with the Jesuits to, to China. But here we actually have a, a, a version of it through the channel, through the transmission channel of Arab or Persian. OK, so Golestan of Saadi, a very important uh, text of Persian literature, was used among those, uh, among those uh, readers to understand the natural world, uh, to understand the experiences of the writer. So let's see a little bit what those uh, signs, you know, what of the, all of those things under the text and around the text mean. And we will see things that are, that are shared with earlier things. We have an, a number of places, especially the one letter comment, those are the, the grammatical markers of what is the subject, what is the predicate, what is is au fait, what is attributes, all of those. And this is a way to, in many ways to parse the sentences and to understand you know, the units that we're talking. Interestingly, there is no differentiation between Arabic and Persian. They just you know, do something in continuation despite our I uh, would, uh, would I say like an external modern view of Arab and Persian as two different languages. For those readers, there were two registers of one language. OK, so we can see, for example, the kha, khabar, means like a, 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 a subject and, and uh, mubtada and etc. is of it. Another layer is the layer of interpretation. OK, what do we do with the words? Demar that uh, you know, Borze uh, Demar in Persian is the brain. Okay, I don't know the work. I need to find a way to to uh, to explain. It. Or that's the master that explained. And then they find various forms of uh, of transliterating them. One is the uh, the Xiao Erjing. This is like writing and interpreting in vernacular Chinese, but using the Arab Persian alphabet. And there we see that it's very very vernacular. For example, if this is like even some sun, like a, a, a northwestern dialect, you know. <laughs> what is uh, uh, You would say woman the nauze. It's like, uh, and then you, you would say woman the nauze. Yeah, it's something. Um, sometimes, uh, oh, this didn't come well. OK, uh, yeah, the, you, you, sometimes you would have um, more f uh, like sorry, you have like really dialect dur, which is uh, another example of northwestern uh, uh, vernacular. In some cases, they would use Chinese because, in many ways, this is like saving time. Like you know, you don't want to invest in in literacy, so you use uh, uh, the Arab Persian text. But Ren is very easy; it's only two strokes, so it's much uh, easier than to like uh, write it in Arabic. Letter. So uh, this is for your uh, Ren which is mutakadimun, I think it was over there, something. It's also an interesting translation. But Chen Ren, they, they, they use this kind of, uh, of writing. Oops. Um, yeah, OK, for example, here they use Arabic, Persian, <laughs> and all sorts of like combinations. So sahib dilan, yo, dil, the ren. So this is <laughs> Chinese translation, Persian, Chinese translation, transliteration and uh, uh, Chinese character. So it's like uh, this kind of thing. And this is all in order to, sorry, in order to get the gist of what is going on in that text and to, to teach it, to teach it to the, the, the class of students that sits around you. At one point, uh, this, this kind of texts, this kind of notes, began to appear in, in, uh, in print. And, and to circulate in Chinese. They took the notes, they took all of this water and put it in, in, uh, in put it, uh, wrote it down as a, as a self-standing work and circulated. And we still have, this is not uh, an example of it, but we still have uh, examples of very vernacular type of Chinese uh, rendering of, uh, for example, a Persian uh, uh, text or, or uh, Arabic uh, uh, works on theology that appear. A second level would be like, OK, take those vernacular texts, give it to someone that reads vernacular text, but also, re uh, sorry, reads vernacular Chinese, but also has the, the education to write very high quality of Chinese. And he would elevate the writing. And then we start finding texts that are 
like they, they, they fit into the standards, they meet the standards, the aesthetic standards of China, and those texts would be would be read outside the, the, the community of people that read Arab Arabic and Persian, bringing in many ways to the wider Chinese audience ideas from the, from the uh, Western experience, from the Arab or Persian, Greco-Roman experience. So what kind of experience, I use this very vague term, experience, but what can experiences, what kind of, what, uh, uh, what kind of knowledge moves there and how it looks like? Um, so when we, uh, like, uh, uh, s like a, a short uh, a survey of things that we actually see that move through those texts is, for example, discussions about the epistemological or cognitive uh, systems. What is the brain? How do we think? Yeah, okay. How, uh, what is the brain? How do we think? Cosmology. What how the world looks like. The body and soul dichotomy, a very central issue in both uh, Western non-Muslim but also in Muslim talks, etc. Human generation. And the methods that we bring in, philology and grammar to uh, a scholarly uh, discourse that doesn't have this, logical, the idea of logic here, and taxonomies through creation and uh, through creating all sorts of lists. For example, uh, I'm interested in looking at all the halal uh, animals. So I create all sorts of lists and frame the various uh, aspects of each animal. And in many ways, I, in many, I create a natural, a natural philosophy only by looking at one aspect. Few examples, because time actually lives. So for example, Leo Zhe, who I will refer uh, to a number of works, gives us a very interesting, this is an example from his work, he's talking about like uh, one level in the embryonic development, okay? Now, in order to explain the embryonic development, he needs to call, he needs to bring in the four humor theory. The Galenic Hippocritic four humors is based on Aristotle. And we see here that he takes this, call them the Suban, and brings it within a framework that needs to explain the four humors to audience that does not know what four humors and has a system of Chinese medicine that doesn't work like that. But those two things need to be negotiated and need, need to be explained. So the, this is one example, for example, for here. Oops, sorry. Um, OK, another just to show, OK, so other people would also bring. He actually, Ma Zhu, another one of those scholars, would bring us the, 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 the question. He said, OK, you'd, like, uh, uh, we talk about five elements. The Arabo Persian literature talks about four elements. What, what's going on here? And he gives the entire discussion of okay, uh, there is like some sort of a solution. One element uh, is not that important. <laughs> so good. No, no, I'm not doing justice to him, but uh, yeah, that's the spirit. Um, we want to understand the development of the development of a human body. Here, it's interesting. He would bring in uh, the humors. But he would bring also the Chinese ideas of pollution that are crucial for Chinese medicine. He would here, in many ways, bring in, uh, if you see, there are two centers, the xin, which is the heart. Those are the bodily organ, the xin, but the now. And here he gives reference to, like, there is like an a, a ongoing uh, discussion about what, uh, the centrality of is it the, the, the brain as the command center of the body or the heart. Uh, Etc. and something that Chinese medicine doesn't include, and this is the soul. Okay, so we have here like an interesting combination. Again, here, how do we define, how do we discuss this idea of ruh and nafs to audience that doesn't have those concepts? And last thing, some, you want to bring in a discussion of uh, a hadith that said that uh, uh, people should shave the mustache. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not uh, as pious as this hadith is supposed. Um, so uh, the Jamia Tirmidhi gave this idea. What do they do when they need to read this kind of thing in China? And you find that actually Liu Zhe, for example, needs to really like, struggle with that. And he finds also, yeah, this is uh, excessive blood that stacks here. And then he goes with the long, it just took like uh, parts of it, excess of blood. Uh, those are categories that are associated with the six warps. And give a whole explanation of why this hadith you know, has some physiological uh, ground behind it. Because just quoting a hadith that not, doesn't give us here anything. So he needs to find the logic behind it, the rationalization of a hadith. Um, 
maps. You know, this is an interesting map of the how many we have here, seven, the seven, uh, 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 what do you call it, continents, with, of course, the, the, the Persian, uh, the Persian uh, pronunciation of those things. So you have, uh, you don't, uh, it's for Chinese readers, but they wouldn't talk about China, the uh, Chini and uh, Sudan and etc. So this is another example of how, in that case, cosmological, geographical, but if we look a little bit on the creation, there's also astronomical experience of one part of the world reaches China through those texts. And I think I'm going to stop here. I'll be happy to answer the, any other question. Thank you.